hello and good afternoon, everyone, or oh, good lunchtime, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It will depend on, on the time that you are in. It's 12 noon here in the UK today, and it's a very exciting interview I'm doing for you today. And hopefully you'll be joining me and hopefully you'll find it very interesting as well. I'm interviewing Professor Lawrence Allison today. Now, um, Professor Allison is actually an MBE, which is a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. And I hope he will explain to us what exactly that means. And he's the director of the National Unit for Critical Incident Decision Making, at least the University of Liverpool Psychological Resource Network, and is chair in forensic and investigative psychology at the university's Institute of Population Health. Now, I was actually reading that, which is why I was covering myself with that with that image there for a moment. Um, Professor Allison was also my MSc supervisor my, when I was doing my masters and my PhD supervisor. So um, I've known him since um, 2007. And uh, he's a great guy in many ways, but you'll see him now in a second. Just in terms of housekeeping, wherever you're watching this, please just introduce yourself in the chat in the comments. I always love seeing where people are actually watching from. And um, if you have any questions, I would encourage you to, to ask them, but please type a cue at the beginning so I know exactly when I'm scanning through the comments, which one I actually need to show and um, read out to Lauren. So please let us know where you're watching from, if you can. It's always good to hear that. And any questions that you want to know, please just um, type them in here. Now, without further ado, let me bring back the professor himself. So, Lawrence, thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Suzanne. Good to speak to you, and thanks for asking me. It's good to see you. Well, um, can I please get you to tell us about how you got into the field of investigative psychology and why? Yeah, so a long time ago now, I've been working for the police, the law and enforcement services, military for nearly 30 years. So um, you talked about the MSc that you did. I think I did mine in 1992. Um, so a long, long time ago. Um, I formerly was at University College London. I did a general psych degree and uh, I was interested in crime and criminality. And at, at that time, I think as many people will know, the whole silence of the lambs thing was big. The offender profiling thing was massive. And uh, that was the sort of direction of travel that I was interested in. And um, I, I did the MSc course. I think I was the second intake for that MSc course in investigative and forensic psychology in 1993. Finished my undergraduate degree in 92. Second intake in 1993. Did my MSc. And <coughs> did a lot of work on the offender profiling uh, domain. In fact, much of it was directed at um, debunking some of the myths around profiling. Um, you know, sort of debunking what wasn't possible. And as you know, Suzanne, obviously this, your PhD was on that area. Much of it was kind of revising the way in which we, you know, supported and helped profilers and as they're now known, behavioral investigative advisors. And then, you know, I've been on that journey for 30 odd years now and my research profiles change significantly as, as these things do, as times change and you, you find where you can make more of a difference in other areas. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that as, as we continue. Mm -hmm. So it's th that is an interesting thing that many people are attracted into the field because of things they see in TVs and on, on TV and movies and all of that. And it's, I didn't know that you were, you know, maybe attracted to that because of that as well. But then much of your work is actually saying it's, it's not really like that. And uh, can you just give us a quick um, contrast of what people think maybe profiling is or behavioral investigative advice is and what it actually is? Sure. Well, back back in the day when I was sort of interested in I mean, I think a lot of students get interested in this area through drama and fiction and, you know, there's countless cop shows or you know, documentaries about crime. And, and that's great. It's great that those things pull people into the field. Um, but as you know, when you're then in the field, you realize it doesn't look quite like that. So if you look at Silence of the Lambs, the idea that you basically speculatively come in and you have some instinctive sense of what's going on, you know, really isn't the reality. And that's obviously not good enough in terms of the legal parameters either. It needs to be an evidence-based approach. It needs to be scientific. You need to know the confines of, of what is possible and what isn't. And certainly in the early 90s, um, a lot was promised and um, uh, not a lot was achieved. And so there were a number of people. I mean, I worked in the, on the Colin Stagg case with David Cantor in the early 90s where a uh, so-called profiler um, was was involved in a very controversial case and David and I ended up working for the defense to kind of debunk that that approach of profiling so there was an extent to which in the early days of it it was ill-formed very embryonic not evidence-based and was promising more than it could actually deliver 
And then, as you know, you know, a, a behavioural investigative advice team were formed within um, the police service that was more rigorous, was more evidence based, and was more moderate in what it could conclude about the offenders. And that's that's developed a whole field of what we now call investigative psychology. That started, I guess, around that hub and spoke model of, you know, profiling, but has branched out into decision making and investigative interviewing and geo profiling and various other bits and pieces. So yeah, it's um, I think it's great that students get involved because of what they see in dramas. But much like as I'm sure we'll talk about the area of investigative interviewing. I mean, if you look at dramatic reenactments of of interviews, police interviews, they are woefully. Uh, uh, inadequate as representations of what goes on in the real world and the idea that you can kind of coerce someone or berate someone or beat someone up into a confession just doesn't work i mean frustratingly you never see good dramatic re reenactments of these things and mark fallon who um, was one of the guys that was the whistleblower around the enhanced interrogation tactics in the us will tell you and it is his strongly held view that programs like 24 that were around at the time of the enhanced interrogation tactics uh, that were proposed by the US government uh, were influenced by dramatic reenactments that suggested that it was acceptable to kind of bully, coerce, berate or manipulate people. And so there is a there is a peril or a danger in um, dramatic reenactments if there isn't some kind of proportionality or accuracy around what happens in reality. I think that's that's the thing with um, with many things in terms of information overflow that we have nowadays. If something is not dramatic and does not stand out and doesn't grab mm. your attention, it's just going to be ignored. You walk through any corridor in a university, in, in an office building, there are so many notices on the walls and you, you just don't register any of them, don't do you? And in in terms of, you know, who would who would want to watch a um, an interview that is you know, very, very slow paced and, and very friendly. Well, actually, I'd, I'd hope that many people would want to watch it because if they want to know how to do it properly, but it's mm. definitely more entertaining and um, fantastic in the sense that, oh my God, you know what's going on there. If they bang the bang the table, especially if you're, if you're on the side of the interrogator and maybe you're frustrated with the suspect and you think you, think you know that they're guilty and they should just open up and, you know, and, and talk. So, that is that is something about how people pay attention unfortunately that's always going to skew what is going to be shown it's um, mm. a little bit like in research you know things that are um disproving something or proving something new are more interesting than something that's just replicating even though we really need studies to replicate others to solidify the whole evidence base so it's, i mean having said that i think i mean i do think there is a place not that we should be talking about dramatic reenactments but I, I think it is important actually i think there is a place for a more human drama where you know the the interview is not all sound and fury and and uh you know batman levels smashing tables up and stuff like that i mean i think there's something dramatically very compelling about seeing something work between two people that don't necessarily want to talk to one another and certainly when we train police officers in interviewing you do see some very dramatic and actually i would argue quite emotionally intense moments that are quieter that are more humane, that aren't about adversarial uh, self-aggrandizement or um, anger or berating. And actually, I think it's weird that, that um, people want to see uh, someone essentially bully someone that is under their control. I mean, it's not, not a very heroic act, is it? I mean, one of the things that I think is always difficult about Batman or any of these superheroes or whatever is that, well, okay, if they're supposed to be heroic, the idea that you've got someone in your interrogation room that's completely under your control because they're they're in your building, they're chained to the desk, and then you just shout at them or threaten to beat them up, that's, that seems to me not very heroic. What is much more heroic is having the self-control and uh, ability to be more professional about things and not use what essentially is a massively asymmetric power position to try and, you know... Um, strong arm information out of people that's not a very heroic act well just just sticking with that asymmetry i think that's that that's the case in policing overall um in that i think the the recruiting tactics are very skewed still towards the testosterone driven macho action um kind of person who would be interested in that so many videos you know it's fast-paced music 
Um, even recruitment videos, they, you know, may, maybe it, it depends on the police force, but some of the, I have seen are still, you know, trying to to mm. pump you up and, you know, you're, you're in the sirens, so pursuing someone, you're wrestling someone to the ground, putting handcuffs on them, drugs, and that's recruiting the wrong kind of person because really the people that we need today in, in police forces is people who have the skills to talk to someone, who are, you have the empathy and you know, maybe maybe skills of a social worker, someone who's good at um, at really leveling with people, more much more of a therapeutic sense, and you know, diverse diver, a diverse police force actually has fewer force use of force incidents, and I think the statistics actually say that only twenty percent of calls that come into the police are related to crime. Mm -hmm. And a very high proportion are about people's mental health issues. You don't need to be chasing someone down necessarily. In some cases, yes, but in it's it's just not necessary. And I think the this action hero image of the police officer is very outdated. And we need people with a much different, very much different skill set nowadays. And and that's actually one of the things we're going to be talking about. This contrast contrast of what people want to see. You know, the the action interview and and actually what's going to happen. Before we get to that, I'd like to know. Um, in terms of investigative psychology and all the work you've been doing, what, what are your main research interests and how have they changed over time? Hmm. Well, so <clears throat> there's three areas of research that I'm involved in now. The first is um, we've developed tools uh, for profiling indecent image offenders. So for a number of years now, I'm trying to think how many years, a good 10 years, we've developed different risk pro profiling tools um, to uh, resource manage the uh, overwhelmingly high numbers of men, and it is nearly always men, that are downloading, distributing, or in possession of indecent images. So there's various different tools that we've developed for the UK police that have now rolled out to 24 European countries and are being used basically all over the world. Um, so that's a, 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 a piece of research that we're very pleased with because it's saved a lot of children, um, it's picked up a lot of offenders, and it's led to a lot of convictions. Um, so that's the first piece of research, and we're continuing with that now um, under the auspices of the Home Office and the National Crime Agency. The second area of research um, that we've been involved in for a number of years is looking at decision making and specifically critical incident decision making. And in particular, uh, how people calculate making least worst decisions. So to just describe that, it's we're, we're looking at instances normally at a high level strategic level where uh, an individual is responsible for a very serious, high stakes, uncertain decision has an option of doing A or B and both A and B look, look bad. I mean, you know, we're in, we're in, we're in the era of critical incident decision making pretty much every day at the moment with this pandemic where, you know, do we open up and risk more infections? Uh, um, uh, do we open up too soon? Do we open up too late and kill businesses? You know, there's no right, there's no definitively right answer. What If you do A, then you're compromising B. If you do B, you compromise A. And what we found in that area is that oftentimes people are um, very tardy in their decision making. So most often the problem that they encounter is decision inertia or redundant deliberation, which is constant rumination about the problem until the point at which they've no longer got that window of opportunity to act so they're too slow to act so that's the other area of, of research that we've been doing and then the third and final area which I, I think we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail is the work that we've been doing on uh, interviewing or if you're from the states interrogation uh, which is basically looking at the most effective methods to secure information from individuals that might be suspects or um, high value targets uh, uh, or informants and so on. So, so we've been looking at a large set of field data. In fact, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the is our ability to have secured the the largest corpus of data in the world on real interrogations with um, suspects in a counterterrorism environment. And we've systematically poured through that material, analysed it in great detail, and we think we've uncovered um, the best ways of securing information from people. Mm -hmm. So that's the third area of, of research that we've been involved in. All of those are working in parallel. We're very busy with all of those areas, um, but those are, those are the three key things that we're that we're focused on at the moment. And uh, you know, when you say getting um, effective interrogation or interview tactics with suspects, I think we want to qualify that by effective. We mean that the, whatever they tell us is actually true, because you know, um, hundreds of years ago, it was very effective to torture women until they admit they were a witch. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, I probably would have at some point if they were drowning me, burning me, cutting bits off me. But um, we want these confessions to be true. So whilst you can coerce people into confessing to things, we only want the information that is actually accurate. So that's what we mean by effective here. Um, can you tell us what led you to receive an MBE? Uh, can you explain what it is, especially for people from other countries than the UK? And tell us about um, what it was, the work that you uh, what you were awarded it for. Hmm. So uh, it's it's called the Member of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, which actually you had to write down because if you just very impressive what, what an MBE is, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, yeah, it was, it was at the end of the tail end of last year. I got a very nice phone call from someone that works at that level saying oh you know police have actually been awarded an mbe and at first i wasn't sure what it was for they were they were very sort of um cagey said i can't speak to anyone about it can't even tell emily my wife or anyone else in the family blah 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 okay i said fair enough then i got a letter confirming what it was about my understanding is that it's because of the very solution focused approach that i've taken as a as a psychologist or scientist to assist people um either in law enforcement or defense or security or in fact during the pandemic we did a lot of work um uh during the pandemic to look at resilience building in uh people that would that had been working in icus and so on so i think it was i think it was awarded as a kind of recognition of what i've been doing for the last 25 30 years really using science to reduce suffering um basically help help save people i mean you know our work on child protection has saved countless children or helped safeguard children and indeed our work on interrogation has led to you know intelligence gathering and information yields that have prevented attacks and um kept people safe so that was my understanding of it obviously you know because we're in pandemic times i haven't been able to go pick it up yet so i think they're going to put it in the post but that that's what it was for so uh yeah and i'm not cool enough to refuse it so um it was nice to be recognised for something. Would you, um, if if it didn't have to come in the post, would you go and get it from the Queen herself? I would love to get it from the Queen. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, excellent. Well, well done. Um, you had a more productive year than productive year than myself. Then, um, tell us about your approach to investigative interviewing now. Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, I'm the sort of scientist that doesn't work in a lab. I, I guess best describe myself as a field based researcher. I'm quite cynical, if I'm honest, about a lot of lab-based research. Um, I tend to be much more interested in what the actual practitioners are doing in the real world. And so when we were fortunate enough to receive some research funding to look at this thorny issue of, um, you know, how how do you engage people that don't want to talk to you uh, in the booth, as the Americans call it, um, what works? So... um, I spent a lot of time convincing some senior police officers that it would be useful to them to allow us to see and observe, categorize, code, understand and analyze why some interviewers were more effective than other interviewers. And by effective, as you rightly said, what I mean by effective is this, that in an interaction with a suspect or witness or victim, Um, An interviewer provides complete autonomy and choice for the detainee suspect witness or interviewer about what they want to talk about and that they are engaged in a professional relationship where they provide choice. They do not judge or prejudge or assume they know what's going on. They keep a professional distance from it, but they have a professional relationship with that person in the booth such that that person can make a considered choice about what they want to talk about which might be the truth or might be a lie or might be nothing at all but what we found was that those interrogators or interviewers that did most well were the ones that retained principles of honesty empathy autonomy and they used a thing that that we, we may get into the ability to reflect back what they were hearing and probe and explore it more so there were these kind of four key values honesty empathy autonomy and reflection And then they were also the the most effective interviewers were those interviewers that were able to um, be emotionally self-controlled such that they didn't start dropping into what we call maladaptive interpersonal behavior. So they didn't become sarcastic or too aggressive. They didn't become too dominant or demanding. They didn't become inappropriately warm and over familiar. 
and they didn't get bullied by the suspect. They were able to adjust and be fluid and organic with the person that was sat in front of them. In the same way that we all, perhaps with, you know, if we've got children, you know, you know, very many people watching this will have different kids. Kids have different personalities. You have to relate to children differently based on their personalities. If you want a rapport to be to to be successful with your child, such that that child can make a considered choice about what they want to talk to you about, then you have to make some adjustments to to compensate for, or at least be cognizant of what it is that each of your children need, because everyone's different. So this idea that you have this kind of cookie cutter interrogator that are all the same and they do the same thing in exactly the same way, in exactly the same order, we need to knock that out of our interviewers. We need to loosen them up, free them up, let them be a bit more organic, lean into their strengths, but compensate for their weaknesses. So it's these two principles of these basic value systems around honesty, empathy, autonomy, reflection, and objectivity, alongside the ability to have enough emotional self-regulation to not be uh, inappropriately influenced by the suspect's potentially bad behavior, but to always retain a, a degree of interpersonal competence, interpersonal sensitivity, which is recognizing what's going on with the other person, and interpersonal versatility, which is the ability to be fluid and to be able to move. So this this might be counterintuitive to, to quite a few people. They, they may be wondering, and you know, I'd, I'd like you to pr I'd like to prompt a response from you so people understand this a little bit better. If if you're giving the suspect, let's say, autonomy to wh whether or not they want to talk to you, I mean, by law they have that anyway. But also, uh -huh. what to talk about? How how do we still ensure that the interviewer gets to the the topics and gets to cover everything uh -huh. they need to cover? Yeah, good question. So so let let's talk about this principle of autonomy and 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 place it within this legal framework that we know about about the right to silence so as you know people that have seen um police interviews before will know that each uh suspect or witness or victim has a right to silence you do not have to say anything but anything that you do say may give them as evidence well let's take that as one example we always say when you're doing that bit of the caution sell it to the person that you are speaking to you know, I've seen interviewers say, I've just got to do this bit at the front end. And then when we get through that, we'll get no, you know, sell that as a thing that is that person's right. You know, you've got to do it in a way that is authentic and genuine. So that you're really saying to them, it really matters that you consider what it is that you're saying. And you don't have to say anything to me. But what you do see may, may be given in evidence. Don't roboticize it. And what we found was that people that, that were able to deliver that in an authentic and genuine and honest way, we're much more likely to get the person talking. Whereas if you kind of robotically, mechanistically go through it, people get a bit wary. Or if you say it in a way that you don't mean it, well, I kind of would like you to talk to me, but you don't have to. People resist. And it's what we call the principle of reactance. And that goes throughout the whole interview. It's not just the bit at the beginning, it's everything. Um, I'll get to the second bit about topics in a minute and, and staying on target. But there's a principle that we know about in, in, in human behavior called reactance, where the more one feels controlled, the more one resists. So Suzanne, if I say to you, for example, right, you're looking at a screen now, I do not want you to take your eyes off that screen. You must not remove your eyes from what you're looking at, at the screen. I don't want you to look right. Yeah, so you've just committed exactly what I would expect you to do, which is reactance. Now, before I said that, you weren't even thinking about doing it probably. But now that I've kind of, you know, so the more I try and force you into a corner or persuade you to do something, it instills in all of us a desire to resist and, and counter it. Or another example that I always say, I've got a box on my desk here. I'm going to leave the room and I put on that box, box a label which says, do not look in this box. Yeah. Well, if that label's on the box, I'm pretty tempted to have a look at it now. So you don't want to create reactants. Um, you know, there's, there's studies actually of animals in zoos where... Um, I think it was a study on polar bears where they allowed the polar bear to uh, have a space in which they could not be seen by the zoo goer. Yeah. So they didn't try and control that. You know, you can engineer uh, the geographic environment of any animal so that they're constantly on display. Yeah. Well, in this particular zoo, they were able to to afford the polar bear an opportunity to to, to basically leave and be hidden. And when they did that, those polar bears that they gave that choice to actually displayed themselves more frequently because they were happier and they didn't feel controlled. And th those that were constantly on display 
just you know, mortality was lower. They didn't last longer. And then when they did give them an opportunity to be on display, they took it immediately. So the more you give choice, the more you give freedom, bizarrely, seemingly counterintuitively, um, people will be more likely to speak. The more you try and force them, the less they will speak. The more you give them the choice, the more they will speak. And that goes for, you know, we'll all have seen it and police officers that have done interviews as well. You'll sometimes get very belligerent um, uh, 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 solicitors that will really insist on you not talking. Well, we always say, look, when you get a, a solicitor that's that belligerent that keeps putting their hand on the, the suspect saying, I'm, you know, I need to re remind you of your right to silence and constantly cutting through them, then the interviewer should say, look, Mr. So-and-so, are you clear that this is your choice about whether to speak or not? So anything that I ask you, it's completely your choice whether you say nothing, no comment, or you speak to me. It's not your solicitor's choice, and it certainly isn't my choice. This is your choice. And by doing that, you're kind of neutralizing a forceful solicitor. And that's fine for them to give advice, but it's not an instruction. And in the same way, as an interviewer or interrogator, it's not for me to advise them. It's for me to make sure that they are aware of their legal rights to talk or not. And the hungrier I get for it, the more unsuccessful I will be. And when we found some of our best interrogators, I would describe as not shrinking violets. You know, these people that have been in war zones, we've had Navy SEALs that are interrogated, we have some hardcore military personnel. But they're very um, controlled in the interview room. It's not a machismo thing. And these are machismo guys and girls, right? They're people that have had tough lives, they've been in tough situations. But in the booth, in the interview room, they're very controlled. They're very non-judgmental. They're very impartial. And actually, the key thing is they're, they're humble. They're not hungry. They're not forceful. They're not using some cheap social persuasion technique or influence strategy. No. It doesn't mean they like the person that they're speaking to. It doesn't mean that they've got to befriend them. It doesn't mean that they've got to do some kind of fake, do you want a cup of tea or are you warm enough or any of that stuff. This is not about being friendly. It's about being respectful. It's about being professional. It's about treating people with dignity and it's about providing choice. And if you create that atmosphere in the room, it doesn't always work, of course. And But you are much more likely to get a, you know, an engaged person, whether they lie to you, tell you the truth, don't speak or whatever. Those things are the things that matter. And that's what we want to see with our interviewers. And that actually is really, really difficult because at the end of the day, if you've seen some of the damage that some of the people that they have to interview do, that is a hard ask. Yeah, particularly some of our military interrogators that might have just seen their buddy step on an IED and have a you know bilateral amputation. You can't then expect that person to go and interview someone that they think might have set that IED. You know, to to to, to you have to humanise the people that you're speaking to, and that is a hard ask if you've just seen some of the atrocities that some of these people have committed. But that is what you need to be able to do. You need to be in you know, have an inquiring mind, have the humility to sit back and listen, and be interested in that person's journey not condone it or agree with it or validate it or try and be their friend or any of that bs this is not about friendship rapport isn't about being soft it's about being dedicated and it's about being professional and it's about being curious and it's about using your imagination okay and we've got a few questions here could i maybe ask to do, do you know what would happen? You know your computer better than me. If you pl if you unplugged your microphone, because it is giving us a lot of noise whenever you move. And can we just see okay. if you can still hear me and if we can still hear if you unplug your, um, your I headphones? I actually have a plugged in microphone. I'm using the microphone that's in the actual unit itself. Um, I mean, I can plug a microphone in. I actually have a professional microphone, so maybe that will that will help. Because it's, it's, it's making a lot of noise, all the movements. And... Um, Then I'll get to the first questions when you've done that. Um, Nikki Grieftop, I know you know each other, is saying congratulations. I think that was in relation to your MBE. We've got people watching from the UK, Australia, lots of other places. I can't hear you. Can you hear me again now? Yes. Is that any better? 
Possibly, it will it will depend on how whether it makes any noise when you move. So I'll um, take my earplugs out. It might be that that's causing the problem. So, okay, but... let me show you the first question. So Mark Batifant is asking how or indeed uh, does the interview of a suspect versus a chist? That's a covert human intelligence source. So um, in other countries, it might be called um, informant. informant. Yeah, for yeah. instance, change in terms of approach. So does the interview of a suspect versus a chis in, um, change in terms of approach? Yeah, very good question. Um, the short answer is I don't believe it does. Um, bizarrely, just before we got the research funding from the High Value in Detainee Interrogation Group in 2012, I did an internal document looking at the most successful source handlers. Um, so chis, as you say. And the same model holds true. Um, there's a slight uh, um, variance in it in that we found that a lot of so we haven't talked about the model in too much detail but but basically the four archetypal interpersonal skills that you need to master are dominance which is basically leading and taking control um, cooperation which is basically doing the social warm and friendly stuff capitulation which is having the ability to sit back listen and have you be impatient and assist and the fourth archetype is being able to deal with conflict and what we found with the most successful chis handlers was that they tended to be high on the leadership role. And they tended to be high on the warmth role as well. So those were the two key archetypes that were most successful. But the bottom line is that the, these, these principles that we're talking about in terms of honesty, empathy, autonomy, reflection, the four archetypes and the versatility, they, they are drawn from a very large body of literature that goes back to the 1950s, and whether we get into this work or not. I don't know, but Timothy Leary's work on personality theory uh, or Carl Rogers' work on humanistic approaches to counselling and therapeutic interventions. So there's a big history of this stuff working before in different domains. It works in suspect interviews. We've done stuff now. Um, worked with an excellent student last year that was doing stuff on uh, interviewing uh, victims of abuse. The model holds true there. But even outside of the forensic domain, these principles um, work students and, and teachers, um, employees and uh, colleagues. You know, there's a there's a lot. I mean, in fact, if people are more interested, there's a book, I think, called the uh, Interpersonal Handbook of Social Psychology or the Interpersonal Circumplex. And it's about 50 chapters on all the different domains in which these, these various different models work. So it's not peculiar to suspect interviewing. And in fact, the research that we're doing now, we're looking at um, interviewing sex offenders. And the same model holds true. In fact, if, if anything, it's stronger. Um, so yes, it, it applies within the CHIS domain as well. Yeah. Okay, next question, Gary Pankhurst. When providing autonomy, can it get derailed by a controlling manipulative suspect and are there routes back without creating reactants? Hi, hello, Gary, it's nice to, nice to hear from you. Good to see you uh, and good question. And I think this, this relates to what I did not answer with Suzanne earlier where I think you were hinting at, well, if you give them complete autonomy and choice, can they go off in all types of directions? The short answer is yes. And so the all these tactics need to be used um, in recognition of what your goals are in any given interview, right? So it's not you can talk about whatever the hell you want. And in fact, when we see rapport go wrong or get misdiagnosed, you'll see interviews coming in saying things like, right, okay, well, we're here to interview you about um, uh, you've been arrested for uh, these images of but tell me what you're interested in. And you can see the suspect thinking, what? where is this going? So you need to set the rules of the room early on. You need to be very goal oriented in your direction. And so um, as long as you are mindful of the direction of travel, your end destination, I guess what I'm saying is be clear on what your end destination is, where you want to end up. You should be asking questions and probing in that direction so that we're both going on the same journey. And you may have occasions where you've got something very manipulative who wants to take you elsewhere. Now, my suggestion would be, I don't know how much detail we want to go into here, but if you get someone like that, don't assume you've got them like they're like that too. So we always talk about three counts and you're out. So it's okay to let the person wander off once. It might be okay to let them wander off twice. Once it gets to the third time, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe this is a tactic of what we're here to talk about. And then you do need to bring them back on board. But in dealing with that, you just need to be honest and upfront. Say, I've asked you this question three times now. And each time you've talked about this, that's fine. 
but I need to let you know this is the question I'm asking. And that can help you keep on topic. So when I say autonomy, I don't mean by any one of that's nothing to do with this interview. You need to be clear on why you're here. And actually, what I find when I'm role playing a difficult suspect is I almost find it annoying if the interviewer gives me way too much choice and they're too giving. You know, let's keep. To, I I know why I'm arrested. You know why I'm arrested. I actually want to know what evidence you've got to speak in this chair. So let's get on with it. So it is autonomy within the confines of the reason why we're both in the same room. So it would be like, I'm trying to give a ridiculous metaphor now. You know, if you're coming to a football match to play football, you're there to play football. You're not there to play rugby or box or do anything else. So as long as we all know what the rules of the room are, now how you play football is up to you. Whether you pass the ball is up to you. Whether you, you know, want to play the position is up to you. So it's giving enough control, autonomy and... Um, freedom for the person to speak about what they want to speak about as long as we all know what we're in the room for and if okay. i've got a comment here and i agree with it it was easier to hear you when you had your mic in um apologies but you, you your sound is dropping out now sometimes so if we can just give you a second to to plug yourself back in that would be good because we you're, you're saying amazing things and we don't want to miss any of them it may just be my connection um Let's put those in. Uh, and maybe I need to sit a bit closer to the actual computer. So you'll have to forgive me. Okay. My face is on the screen. Is that any That's better? Fine. For now, yes. Yeah. Um, how did you develop this uh, new way of interviewing using rapport? Um, well, it was partly a function of, I mean, Emily, who is my wife uh, and a psychologist as well, has been working in the counselling and therapeutic domain for many years. And um, for those of you that work in that domain, you'll be very familiar with um, uh, Miller and Rolnick's work on um, behavioural change. So she was very familiar with that that work in counselling. So, I mean, Emily is, is at least 50% responsible for the way that we approach this. Um, and then it was to do, yeah, there we go, Miller and Rolnick, excellent book, highly recommend it, motivational interviewing. Um, so, so we drew on that heavily. And uh, my background is looking at interpersonal psychology, and I was very interested in Timothy Leary's work about personality or interpersonality, how two people interact with one another. So prior to Leary, there was a lot of work on personality as a kind of static or stable trait. And Leary's view was, well, actually, that's fine and true. But actually, to really capture what it is that's going on in terms of personality, we look, need to look at how people relate to one another. Um, so that was an, an, an informative part of it as well. I mean, rapport is pretty ill-defined sort of ephemeral idea, really. And our objective was to codify it and to observe it behaviorally. So we've got a, a system that we call ORBIT, which stands for Observing Rapport-Based Interpersonal Techniques. And Suzanne, I don't know if you want to flag up our latest OUP book. If you can chuck that on the screen so that 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 book there which is um from oxford university press that talks about all our academic work specifically around uh, our work on counter-terrorism interviewing in the military and law enforcement and our objective really was i mean in some ways it doesn't really matter how you define rapport it's can you observe a set of behaviors that 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 lead to results and the answer is yes you can what we know our elite interviewers do is they are honest they have empathy they have they provide autonomy they're very good at reflecting back what they hear they're interested in people's thoughts feelings and beliefs and they're able to adjust interpersonally to the person that's in front of them is that rapport does it really matter it doesn't you know it, it, there's a set of behaviors that we know our elite interrogators do that, that result in information you know, so not only do we code the behaviors, we code the result of the interview. So we look at what we call yield, which is capability, opportunity and motive. And we look at people, location, action and time. And what you find is those interviewers that are interpersonally skilled and are able to adjust accordingly to the person that's in front of them. And they retain this value system of honesty, empathy, autonomy and, re and reflection, get results. They get results. They get people speaking more often. They don't shut people down as frequently. Um, and they get people talking. So, um, you know, there's lots of research that claims to be about rapport or um, rapport-based methods. Um, and I guess my, my feeling is it doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you can see it and train it. And it seems to be a set of behaviours that were 
that we see as two separate things. You know, the value system that you bring into the room as an interviewer and the interpersonal behavior that you engage in to manage the person that's in front of you. Yeah, and that's, thanks for flagging the other book up there. That's the rapport book, The Four Ways to Read People, which gives a kind of simplified but accurate version of what we have seen in our 30 years of research. And in that book, it does it does touch on some of the police interviewing stuff, but it's a much wider book. And um, the reason we wrote that, actually, was when we were training cops, a number of them said to us, not only has this uh, really improved my uh, interview practice, it's actually made me a better father. It's made me a better husband. It's made me a better son to my parents. So there were these were these were techniques that were working in difficult interactions with their children. So that's why we decided to write a more sort of generic, what I might call airport book. Um, yeah, I've got uh, I've put both links into the comments um, for people who can see them. I'm not sure if they're actually being delivered to Facebook. But if if not, email me and um, I'll I'll be able to send you the link. I've got a comment here. Um, I work in fraud and fraud suspects love to talk, usually a load of rubbish. It is important to keep the interview focused but flexible as a suspect talking will often reveal something very relevant to the investigation that they don't recognize it as such. Much better than a suspect exercising their right to silence in a no comment interview. So, yeah, interesting. I mean, fraud, I agree, fraud interviews are uh, I mean, certainly financial crime interviews, I, I can see that. I've worked with the Dutch police in this area, and also those people are often pretty smart. I mean, if you're going to conduct a high-level fraud, you're going to be pretty smart. And that's a good example of, actually, it's not just good enough to have the interpersonal skills. You need very sophisticated domain-specific knowledge to know what you're talking about. I mean, in fact, when I was working with the Israelis a number of years ago, they, they, they were doing some interesting research on the on a number of features that discriminated their elite interrogators from their less good ones. And I think in order of importance, they were, for the first one was what they called battle of wits, which was the ability, a very cognitive um, quality of the interview rather than a social or interpersonal one. The cognitive ability to be able to anticipate what the lines of defense of the suspect were gonna be. So it's almost like playing chess, you know, thinking several moves ahead. The second one was the kind of rapport, interpersonal based stuff. The third one was domain-specific knowledge about um, uh, religious knowledge. The fourth one was uh, cultural knowledge. And the fifth one was an interesting one. It was the absence. The elite interrogators recognized that tricks didn't work. So sometimes you hear interrogators say, well, I'm going to come in. I'm going to have an open book on the table. I'm going to wear a specific tie or I'm going to leave a window open. And the elite interrogators know that that doesn't work. The elite ones know it's me and this person. And that's either going to work or it's not. They ditch the idea of Darren Brown type tricks. Um, but yeah, going back to the point about fraud, uh, yeah, a number of them do love to talk, and a, a part of that is keeping them on focus. Do you know from the you know from the scientific and from the cognitive and from the suspect's perspective, why is it that rapport, building rapport and that mutual respect and giving that autonomy, why is it so much more effective that has been used for for hundreds of years now? Because it's like anything, isn't it? I mean, if you if you if you decontextualize it out of the interview room, and if you've got you know if you've got kids, why does a child want to speak to you? Well, they don't want to speak to you if they feel judged. Yeah, they don't want to speak to a parent that they feel is dishonest. They don't want to speak to a parent that doesn't have empathy for them and is indifferent. And they don't want to speak to a parent that isn't prepared to reflect back some of their values and beliefs and interest in their thoughts and feelings. You want to speak to people that treat you like a human being. You don't want to speak to people that are either robotic or mechanistic or don't care about you or aren't interested in you or have prejudged you. I mean, what we always get as feedback from our actors, and I'm sure you know, there's, there's a number of, uh, I mean, Gary's on here, and you know, you'll have seen this in training. When an actor feels that, that in the questions that you are being asked, there is a prejudged assumption about whether or not you've done it, that shuts the person down. You know, you start thinking to yourself, well, if you think I've done it, why, why are we talking? Yeah. So the reason people talk is because they feel that they are being listened to, that they feel they are not being judged, that they feel that the person, and when I say cares about them, it doesn't mean in a touchy-feely way, but actually has an interest in them or an interest in their journey, and they're objectively curious. They haven't prejudged anything. They're willing to listen. 
you know, and that's sometimes hard when you've got what seems to be very compelling evidence against the person that they appear to be wriggling out of it. You sometimes need to hold back that incredulity of saying, well, come on, you know, you're on the CCTV, we've got your fingerprints all over it, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got to retain that sense of complete objectivity, impartiality and non-judgment. And that, that's, that's why people talk. Mm. We've got a question. There's a lot, a lot of things you can do to put people off. And, you know, and the, 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 the difficult thing about interviewing is you can do all the good stuff and not get results. But if you have a, a person that does any of the bad stuff, they can go wrong very, very quickly. So we do know there's an asymmetry in the bad stuff compared to the good stuff. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time trying to teach our interviewers is if they have got some weaknesses, get rid of those first. If you tend to be a bit sarcastic or a bit judgmental, don't worry about learning anything new. Get rid of that first, because that is the thing that's going to torpedo your interview. Okay, we've got a question here from Seb. He's, he's a police officer. Um, you talk about elite interrogations and high-value targets, but how do you think we can improve the level of interviewing across the board, especially with new cops? Great question, um, Seb. So I think the thing is, you've got to get them early. You know, get get cops early. You know, one of the things that we struggle with uh, with tier three interviewing. So, for those of you that are from an international perspective, basically tier three in the UK is a certain level of skill or course that you are expected to achieve to deal with advanced interviewing. But what we find when we come into some tier three interviewer training is that we have to knock out some bad practice that they've developed over a number of years. So it's almost like they're learning things that we have to get them to unlearn, that are unproductive. And actually, Miller and Rolnick will talk about this in terms of the counselling domain as well. Sometimes when you get fresh new people that aren't, haven't developed bad practice, they're easier to work with. So my short answer to that, Seb, is, you know, get them in as early recruits. And, and going back to what you were saying, Suzanne, earlier about um, cop mentality or cop advertising, and you're quite right. Yes, sometimes you do need the sort of machismo cop that's going to run into danger and deal, you know, action and blah, blah, blah. But you also need the, the cop that is a listener, that is, you know, professionally curious. And you want to work on that early doors. You know, you can. I've seen lots of cops de-escalate de aggressive behavior on the street because they know how to talk to people. And that isn't about being nice to them. Sometimes it's about being firm. But it is at least treating people with dignity. And we've had all these dreadful problems in the States, haven't we, with the George Floyd thing? And, you know, part of that, I'm sure, was to do with training and to do with an atmosphere that was created in Minneapolis. I mean, they were doing what they were calling warrior training for cops. Well, you know, if, you, if you're a street cop, you know, you're, you're not a military personnel. This is policing by consent and... Um, you need to be a good listener. I've, you know, I used to work in a mental health facility and um, you always knew the, the staff that were going to get beaten up or attacked because they were aggressive to the people that they were dealing with. And equally, some of the best people that I worked with in mental health were good listeners. They were non-judgmental. They cared about the patients. Um, they weren't inappropriately overly friendly with them, so they could be firm but fair. And um, and that's what got the results. So, so, yeah, in answer to your question, I think, Seb, it's, it's getting people in early and recognising that these communication skills are fundamental attributes that they need to learn when they're dealing with people on the streets. That will then give them what they need when they get in the interview booth. If they've started on the right track and they're going in the right direction, going on the right journey, they'll bring that into, in, into the interview room. It's interesting that that bit about the different skill set of police officers, because here in the UK, we've got such a shortage of detectives that some police forces have started a direct entry route for detectives. So usually what you have, what you would have to do is you have to be a normal uniformed police officer for at least two years before you can apply to the pathway to become a detective. And with this direct entry, you can apply from any background from outside the police. I, I I could apply. I mean, I'm, I was a civilian in the police in a very variety of roles for over 10 years, but anyone could apply. And if they are found to be suitable, they could be trained as a detective straight away. They do have to go um, and be mm. uniformed officers on the street as well. But many seasoned detectives, interestingly, don't don't like that idea. But I, I would hazard, and I haven't seen much data on it, but I would hazard a guess that the people who apply and are able to skip this more high action role of a response officer for at least two years. They're probably from a more diverse background and many of them are qualified professionals in other in other sets of areas. They may have been teachers, they may have been social workers and are doing anything anything other than being a uniformed police officer. So I wonder if the caliber of detectives that we're getting there 
if there if there is a difference that we can see in terms of their interviewing style and their efficacy in interviewing. Possibly, but the counter argument to that might be this: I think there is there is um, good reason to suspect that officers that have been on the beat and have had to learn the hard way with difficult interactions on the street if they manage that right, might actually be better detectives or might be better interviewers. I get what you're saying, Suzanne, and I agree with you up to a point that you might be getting a more diverse set of officers, but there's also something to be said for, I mean, like I say, you know, I worked on, I, in fact, I was a cleaner at a mental health facility for, for um, 18 months. I was buffing floors and cleaning bathrooms and stuff like that. And that is a good way to learn, um, up close and personal how to manage people that can be difficult so there is some value in that i think there is some value i think and actually i think there's an over focus on getting cops um uh trained or getting degrees completely over the top and there's obviously i mean i come from an academic background i don't want to be sort of slating the idea that, that that people should get an education but i don't think it is a necessary prerequisite for being a good cop uh, equally, in the same way that I don't think that it's a bad thing that cops go and get educated to whatever level that they wish to, um, but uh, there's something to be said for for for, for learning by being exposed to to reality. And certainly, when I was working with, you know, some of the people on the high potential development scheme. Um, we do a lot of scenario-based training, so we don't do a lot of chalk and talk, and we don't do a lot of PowerPoint, and we certainly don't do a lot of theory, but we put them through scenarios that were difficult. And they actually said to us, this is the first most useful thing that we've had in the first two years of our HBDS, because when I'm expected to go out and deal with these difficult things and become accountable and in a senior position, I need to know what that feels like. You know, if I've been working in this domain as an accountant and suddenly I'm given the keys to lead city count, you know, city centre on 12 o'clock at midnight, I know I need to know what that feels like. Um, so there is something to be said for that kind of experiential learning as well as just pure education, I think. Mm -hmm. And how do how do you suggest that if so, if somebody is listening to this and maybe this is the first time that they've heard about this whole approach, can you give them like a step by step recipe list that they can sort of keep in mind next time they go into an interview room? What what would be the best things that they can do? Well, I, I think the first thing is, you know, keep an open mind, be non judgmental, be objective, and, you know, try and mitigate against your natural instinct to presume you know what's going on that would be the first thing i think the second thing is you know even if you can't manage the interpersonal behavior as well you know getting a, a, a basic grip on what it is that you need to present yourself as and the atmosphere that you need to create in the room and like i say you know we all know what honesty is we all should have a rough idea about what empathy is but that's sometimes misunderstood and you and we all have a rough idea about what it means to give someone choice and autonomy and giving them control. I mean, often I hear interviewers saying, well, I need to wrestle back control from the interviewee. Do you? No, because that person will decide they've got all the cards, right? Basically, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to tell you anything. So actually, if I'm the suspect, I'm in control. Let me be in control. Let me feel like I'm in control. And actually, let me be in control. And that's much more likely to get your result. But I do think also it's about interviewers allowing to them to free themselves up a bit and be a bit more human i mean weirdly when i see when i get police officers in training they're all very jolly and sort of human and themselves when i'm speaking to them before we go into the booth and then something happens to them when they become kind of all the same robotic really mechanistic sort of strange uh you know, they, they lose themselves. They, they lose the authentic part of themselves that makes them them. So, I mean, I guess the other thing is just loosen up a bit. Free yourself up a bit and be a little bit more. And when I say conversational, that doesn't mean having a chat with a coffee. Yes, we've got to stick to the topics. But just being a bit more human, a bit more fluid, I think that is. Mm -hmm. And um, if, you, if you had a magic wand and you could make one change in policing, what would that be? It's a bit of a boring one, but I think, you know, it's an investment in some basic training on two things when, when police officers join. Really basic stuff on communication skills, which is largely scenario based. That would be one. And some really basic stuff on decision making, which, again, would be you know. the, the thing about learning as well is this. It's very difficult to abstract cops for a very significant period of time. And how we know people learn is if I abstract 
say, 15 cops on a tier three course for three weeks. A, that's costly. And B, much of what they learn is going to have disappeared in six weeks. It's not how people learn. How people learn is by doing the same thing regularly. So when you think about fitness, right, the best way to get fit is you've got to, be, you've got to commit to a program of, of fitness which is frequent, intense, and then of a certain duration. Yeah? So if I want to lose 10 pounds, I've got to do a little bit of exercise every day. I can't do three hours of exercise and then not do any for four weeks. And that's what we're doing to our cops. We're abstracting them for a significant period of time, shoving a load of complex ideas in their head, expecting them to go back to service, and then expecting them to remember that. And we know that there's this massive you know, p uh, performance decrement over time. So my recommendation would be doing you know, I'm a big favor of a little bit of practice every day. And the violin analogy that I always give is this. If you want to learn the violin, do I spend 24 hours teaching you and then don't come back for a year? Or is it better to say to you, do five minutes a day every day? So if there's one thing that I would change, it would be switching a little bit from this kind of idea of many days abstraction of a few officers to much more micro learning on some of these basic skills so that it's retained and it's cemented and it becomes part and parcel of their everyday work. So that's a bit of a dull answer, but I know that from the research that that is the most successful way to transform learning. Well, you, you say it's dull, but actually it's it's starting to get me to think about the, the courses that I'm going to have on, on my academy. So I, I think that's actually really, really interesting what you said there. I've just put in the link. I don't think it's coming up on LinkedIn to the Ground Truth web website. Can you briefly tell us what that is? It's a ground-truth.co.uk for those who can't see the link. Yeah, so that's our, that's our personal website uh, of a number of psychologists that, that I've worked with for a number of years, and that will set out for you all the various different bits of research that we do. It focuses mainly on the decision-making and communication stuff, um, but there's a set of free resources on that Ground Truth website. There's some open access papers. There's some little media bits and pieces. There's podcasts and so on. And, um, yeah, so that that, that, that that gives a pretty good overview of what we're doing at the moment. Okay, and um, last question to wrap this up. If people only took away, like you said, there's there's a there's a there's a big drop in what people retain. If you if people only retained one bit of information from our talk today, what would you want that to be? Listen more, talk less. Keep it simple. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Professor. Thank you very much for everyone watching and your comments and your questions. And um, we'll um, see you very soon with the next one. Thanks, Suzanne. Good to speak to you. Cheerio. Bye bye. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this content useful. You can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps, and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. Just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com, and on the bottom of each page, you will find a sign up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name, your preferred email address, and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam. This is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts.